Okay, we're back. We're live at three o'clock in, in the afternoon on a given Monday here on ThinkTech, and we're doing community matters. We're talking about use cases for electric cars, as opposed to, or in addition to, or in contradistinction to uh, fuel cell cars, that is hydrogen. Okay, and we have uh, uh, Tim Pam Hunt, who's a, a lawyer and who is uh, the CEO principal of Hawaii Renewable Solutions, LLC. And uh, he's a co-founder co -founder of Think Big, and Big stands for Big Island Green. And he's a board member of the Hawaii EV Association. Um, and he's the author of a book, Solar, Why Our Energy Future is So Bright. Okay? Uh, sort of a, an energy guru on the Big Island. They have a lot of those on the Big Island. So it really means something. And then we have uh, Noel Morin, uh, Morin, if I get that right. And he is um, also involved in the Hawaii EV Association. He's the executive director of the Hawaii EV Association. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you Thanks for having us. So when, when I think of the big island, I think of solar, I think of renewables, I think of clean. I think of the first one to get to 100%. I think of, um, I haven't thought about EVs just yet. And today I will be thinking about EVs. You ask me why I don't think about EVs, the big island. And the answer is, are you ready? Are you sitting down? It's range anxiety. That's why. Because the big island has greater distances than any other island. And so I'd be more concerned about that. So, uh, Pam, you, you uh, want to make an Aristotelian logic case. Uh, in favor, <laughs> we like doing that here on ThinkTech, in, in favor of uh, electric vehicles and maybe not so much for hydrogen vehicles. What's the case you would make, Pam? Yeah, well, just, you know, a, a quick intro. You know, we are promoting at Hawaii EV um, a statewide approach to more sustainable and efficient transportation. And so part of that process for us is thinking about the best ways to achieve that goal. And we've been following developments now for years in battery electric and fuel cell electric. And the basic issue we're kind of raising now is do we want to go down the hydrogen fuel cell route when we have battery electrics already here with dozens of models available, already highly efficient, becoming more affordable, um, when in particular battery electrics are far more efficient than fuel cell electrics? There's about a 3x difference. That's a really big difference. And we're basically trying to kind of raise the question, what are the appropriate use cases for each kind of vehicle? When should we focus on battery electric versus fuel cell electric? What's a use case? Use case is, uh, for example, in light duty transportation, you know, a regular car that you and I would buy to get around. You know, what's the best use case? Um, what's the best technology for that particular use case? We're arguing based on a lot of data now that battery electrics are much more appropriate in that use case. Whereas for example, perhaps in some heavy duty applications, maybe of mass transit, maybe definitely air travel, uh, maybe long-term seasonal storage, maybe hydrogen is a better use case or better uh, technology for that use case. You say maybe, but that's the way it's shaking out right now, isn't it? Well, um, yes and no. Um, there's definitely a push still uh, for FCEVs, fuel cell electric vehicles, uh, for light duty transportation by some folks. And we are suggesting at Hawaii EV now that we probably know enough at this point to suggest that battery electrics are better for that use case. And Noel, please chime in. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to, to add that, um, you know, I, I put on my, my climate action hat here, and it's one of my primary motivators for being involved in efforts like this, and that is we need to figure out the most efficient way to decarbonize, right? To wean ourselves away from fossil fuels so that we can uh, not only uh, attain, um, you know, the emission goals that we, we, we have set forth uh, for, for us, for, for our kids, for the planet, but also to enable energy uh, independence, uh, you know, from all this fossil fuels that we were, were uh, sorely dependent on. So the, 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 the point is, um, the, uh, the, the situation or the applications that allow us to rapidly achieve those goals. And um, uh, if there are solutions already, or if there's a solution or an application for battery versus um, you know, fuel, fuel cell, 
we, we focus the attention there so that we're not too distracted. We're not too, uh, you know, the, 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 the investment, which is limited, the energy, which is limited, and be focused on the solutions that allow for rapid time to market, right? The, the quickest implementation. So, um, and I just, maybe, uh, maybe use case is, a, is a, a technical term. I think maybe another word we can use is application. You know, what applications are, are meaningful for battery, um, you know, uh, electric versus, or, or fuel cell electric. So these are, these uh, as mentioned by Tam, uh, you know, flight, uh, aviation, uh, you know, trans-Pacific uh, freight, uh, and even land freight, really heavy, uh, you know, vehicles. These are ideal applications for hydrogen in our view. So the question is, um, you know, given all the things we need to do and the limited investment, um, you know, funds that we have and limited energy as well, you know, where do you focus the attention so that we can get all of this stuff done as quickly as possible? Uh, let me Tam, add one comment there Tam, real quick. would you accept uh, Noel's amendment to the motion? I would, um, I would. And well, I would he, add, he wants to call it an application instead of a use. Would you accept I think that? that? That's perfect. Yeah, that's much more accessible. But let me add, too, I, I think a good way of understanding this distinction is um, if you have a given amount of green electricity, let's say from wind power or geothermal or solar, uh, you can travel three times as far in that amount of electricity in a battery electric car as you can in a fuel cell electric car when you consider all of the lost power through that entire process of creating green hydrogen and then converting it back into electricity in the fuel cell. So it's not a small difference, it's a really big difference. And the scenario you really does weigh heavily in favor of battery electrics for in particular light duty transportation. Well, if that's so, why, why use uh, fuel cell at all? Well, you know, you were suggesting, and I've been, you know, and I mentioned is that we were already down the road on, on buses and, you know, and trucks and what have you, larger vehicles. Um, but why, if that's so, why don't we just use battery electric for everything and forget about fuel cell? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, first, for um, regular cars, we can't deny, of course, that fueling, quote unquote, a fuel cell vehicle is a lot faster. It does currently take hours to, to charge you know, a battery electric. It's not a big deal if you have uh, charging at home. You simply plug it in like you do your iPhone overnight. It's not a big deal. But it definitely is better to have you know, five, 10 minute fueling if you can. Uh, but that said, um, there's definitely a lot of inertia in some quarters for hydrogen solutions. Uh, based on other benefits of hydrogen. And simply the market has kind of overtaken uh, the use case for you know, the applications for hydrogen and fuel cell vehicles, where it's just really pretty clear if you look out of the market nowadays, the market has chosen battery electrics for most use cases, most applications. We're kind of trying to highlight that. We don't go down in particular on a big island, a path toward an undue focus on hydrogen. Mm. I'd like uh, to no, add- No, let me ask you this. I know you want to make a point, but let me ask you this. Uh, why can't the uh, farmers and the ranchers be friends? Uh, why can't we have them both, you know, in a diverse portfolio of, um, you know, renewable um, fuel cars? Why can't we do both? Yeah, um, so I'll respond to that and also just uh, uh, add to what Tam just described in terms, in response to your question earlier. Um, the, the proper application, uh, ideal application for the fuel cell electric vehicle, they are electric vehicles, um, are those situations where um, gross weight, gross vehicle weight is critical and, um, and where lift is required, right? So having a uh, battery pack on an airplane that will go from, you know, uh, from Honolulu to, you know, the, the, the West Coast is technically not feasible at this point in time because the weight, just the weight of the batteries will not facilitate that. Uh, one could argue something similar for, um, you know, ocean freight. Yeah, with ocean freight, you, you've got a lot of uh, tonnage that you're going to be, um, you know, transporting. And the more, the lighter the vehicle, um, the better. Uh, and to some extent, um, the same can be said for a freight, uh, especially on the mainland where you have, um, you know, these tractor trailers that have to go cross country with, you know, loads of, 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 um, of container, uh, containers, right? Um, in situations like that, the, the total weight of the vehicle is going to impact the range. And, uh, and, uh, and there are expectations of performance, you know, being able to take your 
load from point A to point B within a certain amount of time. So, so I think that um, vehicle weight, the, you know, that that consideration is an important one as it relates to transportation or applications uh, as far as hydrogen is concerned. Now, um, can let's talk about passenger vehicles. Can they coexist? Um, yes, they can coexist, and we see attempts at that in places like markets like California. But the challenge is um, again the the um, okay on on a, on a practical um, you know standpoint. If you have limited resources in terms of let's say the government has limited resources in terms of how they will dis dispense charging fueling stations across the islands to be able to support both use cases, both applications, you will sell and you would have an immense um, expense, right? Um, these, these commercial uh, hydrogen fueling stations that combine uh, all the um, electrolysis and all that, all that required technology can run you know, one to $2 million or so based on the information we've gathered. Um, a DC fast charger, which is required for fast charging of uh, electric cars, Will run uh, 100 to 150 thousand dollars. I mean, they're they're not cheap. So the question is, do you want to invest in all of this infrastructure to be able to support both both um, types of electric vehicles? Um, when on one hand um, you have adequate, you know, uh, manufacturer support, right? You've, the the BEVs, the battery electric vehicles, you see, I mean, constant evolution, right, and in, in innovation. So. Manufacturers are stepping up with their uh, with their EVs. With the you don't see that with the hydrogen uh, fuel cell uh, vehicles. You see that with Toyota. You see that with uh, Hyundai, uh, but not much else. So there's this this practical question or uh, you know issue, which is given limited resources, given limited time to market, the need to decarbonize rapidly. Where would you put your um, you know your eggs, right? And and that's where I think the analysis needs to take into account just available uh, availability of the product uh, you know the feasibility of building the infrastructure in an affordable way the uh, availability of cheap renewable energy because the grid energy for electrolysis just doesn't make sense it's just going to be way way too expensive you need geothermal up and running you need you know you need electricity that is you know south of 10 cents um, there's a lot of that that still needs to be done. And the question is, do you have the time? Right? We, we have less than a decade to affect you know, climate action that'll make a difference. And, um, and we, we just don't have the time to try to do everything. Anyway, that's my perspective. Paul, well, um, you made some very good points just now and well. And I'm, it makes me wanna ask, uh, are you an engineer, a scientist, uh, uh, an, an energy professional? What's your background? I am a, uh, so my background is technology. I used to work for um, a, a Bay Area company, eBay. So I was in their technology group. Um, and uh, I would say that my, uh, my background is primarily around problem solving, but being able to understand root cause, understand you know, what's, what's the causation for whatever the issue is we're trying to address, and then coming up with different options, different solutions, testing those and arriving at the most, you know, cost-effective, most uh, efficient uh, uh, approach. Uh, mm. So that's my background. I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an engineer, you know, I, you know my background isn't in, in solar, like TAM, or, uh, you know, building electric cars, but I have a big passion for solving the climate crisis, and it's, it's forced me to look into all these different nooks and mm. crannies. It shows. So you guys are associated, as I mentioned before, with a number of renewable organizations. And um, you're also not only passionate, but you're advocates for electric vehicles. And of course, in order to get a community to adopt electric vehicles, both in you know, having people purchase them uh, and in developing the infrastructure to support them, those two are obviously linked. Um, you know, you guys must be involved in advocating for certain community steps, community actions, in order to incentivize people to buy, use, you know, the cars and the infrastructure. Uh, so with all these organizations I mentioned, Pam, what, what are you actually doing to incentivize people uh, to buy, use, and support electric vehicles? Well, we have two kind of um, program areas at Hawaii EV. Uh, one is on public outreach and education. 
And as Noel mentioned earlier, we do a lot of uh, public events, including um, rides, uh, trying out different EVs, uh, getting EV owners together to talk about what their experiences are, um, various meet and greets, uh, putting out webinars. Uh, we hold an EV 101 webinar once a year with uh, various experts and legislators. Uh, and then the second major program area for us um, is working on policy, uh, which means basically trying to pass uh, better policies and laws and working with state legislators to actually flesh out um, you know, the best ideas for um, whatever moment in time we're looking at. And we're doing it this year. We have a big effort to create um, a list of recommendations for new bills in the upcoming session. So we're doing quite a bit, uh, which, you know, for what is still a pretty new organization, we're only been around for now, I guess, a year and a half. So we feel pretty good where we are. I'm always sorry when I ask a question like, what bills are you introducing? Because then we don't have enough time to finish the conversation. But let me ask you for the primary ones uh, or grouping them. Uh, in terms of functionality, what kinds of bills are you introducing and supporting? Well, we make recommendations. We're not going to introduce bills per se. Uh, we haven't finished that process internally. I'll just share one idea with you, which is you know top of our list currently, which probably will make the, the final cut. And this is adopting in some form what's called a zero emission vehicle mandate, which is basically you know what Calvin did quite some time ago and requires a, a ratcheting standard for zero emission vehicle purchases by different types of entities. And what those numbers should be in what time frame is the debate. Okay, I'd like to, me, go ahead, go ahead now. Yeah, Jay, I'd also like to just um, highlight something uh, which is uh, what Hawaii Electric Vehicle um, Association embraces. So there's the Electrification of transportation. So let's convert all the gas cars, diesel cars into more efficient electric vehicles. Uh, another dimension is reducing vehicle miles traveled. And that is to figure out ways to reduce the need for vehicles like cars, uh, you know, passenger cars, personal cars. And uh, there are many different things there, mass transit, shared mobility, micro mobility, you know, give, giving the opportunity for people to be able to get to where they need to without necessarily needing to buy a car and use a car. So BMT reduction is very, very important. And I think we're not gonna be able to achieve our decarbonization goals if all we say is let's convert the 1 million plus cars from gas over to electric, right? It's, it's not a very feasible strategy. And then the last thing is circularity. There's, there's this uh, brewing uh, and important conversation around what to do with solar panels, what to do with batteries that have expired their use usefulness in a car, for example. So trying to pave a way for things like that to ultimately be addressed effectively here. And that could be building facilities here that allow for battery use batteries in cars to be re repostured for uh, stationary storage. Uh, having those batteries, uh, raw materials recycled ultimately into new materials, right? Or maybe ship to the mainland for processing. So there's, that's the third uh, leg of what we're trying to do. So electrify, reduce, reduce the need for cars, for the cars that must exist, make them as efficient as possible. And then uh, let's also be mindful of what happens at the tail end of this. Let's make sure that we don't have a mess at the end of this journey that we're on right now. So um, I just wanted to highlight that. And from a, uh, from a legislative standpoint, based on what we've, supported in the past, there's the, um, just as Pam had mentioned, that's one dimension, right, which is high level goal statements that force the market to act a certain way. Another, another dimension would be uh, finding ways to expand infrastructure. So have um, new construction be EV or renewable energy ready, as an example. Um, so there's the infrastructure piece. And then there's also another piece, which is, I think, really important for Hawaii. And that is being mindful of social equity. So if we put together another, this was done back in 2011, another rebate for uh, state rebate for EVs, we need to make sure that the low, uh, low middle income folks will benefit most from programs like that so that we can get more and more, make it more affordable for people who can't afford to buy a car, right? To be able to get behind the wheel. And, uh, and the same thing goes with public charging infrastructure. Um, the people who can, many of the people who are driving EVs now have the luxury of a garage. 
have the ability to plug in, you know, when they get in, just like Karen had mentioned. But what about the others who live in apartments, who live in condos, who are renters, and they don't have the luxury of getting, you know, a charge at home? They need to be able to find those fast chargers, those chargers in the public, and they need to be reliable and, you know, and they need to be everywhere. So that would be the other dimension. I, you know, it's not a very specific bill to your, your, to answer your question, but it gives you an idea of where we're at when, when we talk policy. Well, a, a rebate would be very specific, dollars and cents, a rebate from the legislature, such as the rebate or tax credit, whatever it was a few years ago, which they let it expire. You know, when government it makes an incentive like that, they're, they're, they're giving you a big message. They're saying, we like this particular, you know, conduct. We want to incentivize it. And when they withdraw it, as they did in the case of the uh, electric car uh, tax credit um, or rebate, whatever it was, um, they're giving you a like message. We don't like it so much. We don't think it's important. So it, I, and I think it's critical myself. I wonder how you guys feel about it. I think it's critical we get back to that. And, and there's, you know, there's, um, there's, there's social justice in that because it makes the car cheaper for everyone, including people who don't have a lot of money. And it was back when, you know, working that way. So we're, we're now in a place where we don't have that. Pam, what are you going to do about that? Yeah, well, it's a great point, Jay. We agree 100% on that. And um, as an example, um, California just passed two major funding packages which include different kinds of rebates and other incentives uh, that total $3 billion. Um, now, clearly they are a much larger population than we are. They're more than 20 times bigger than Hawaii's population, but it really shows what we should be doing here in Hawaii. We currently have no rebates and no incentives in Hawaii for this really needed transition. Like you said, they were in place before, but they've, been, they've expired. It's really high time for them to be brought back and really beefed up. Yeah, nothing against auto dealers, but auto dealers do not go out of their way to sell electric vehicles. Uh, all things equal, they, they would pro probably, most of them, rather sell fossil uh, vehicles. And yeah, so really the legislature right. really has to speak on that. And, and for my money, you know, if you see on television, you see these ads for, um, you, you buy the car on the web, and uh, a day or two later, it is delivered to your home and somebody shows you how to use it. You, you never have to go through uh, the, the, um, the troubled experience of dealing with a car salesman for hours at a time, uh, which is you know, a pain that none of us should have to do anyway. Uh, so my, my question is, uh, why can't we develop a system of purchase and delivery that makes it easier, more predictable and quicker? Why can't we do that, Noel? Um, I, well, let me just say that it is happening, number one, right? It's just that it's a model that is not very popular, but it's that, that, uh, that perception or that, um, that mindset is changing. So Tesla started, I believe they started out their, well, their business model is essentially that they're, they have no dealerships, everything's online. You order the car, you customize it, it gets delivered to you. And, um, and now we have other automakers that have started to do the same, you know, uh, with the Ford uh, electric uh, 150 uh, orders can be placed online. The Rivian is done the same way. So I think that as the market starts to experience these different ways of doing things and the efficiencies associated with it, uh, it's going to influence consumer demand, right? Expectation for that type of experience. And that's ultimately going to change the business model or the um, manufacturers, the dealers that have been doing this way, you know, having this way of doing business forever, right? So the, the positive thing is it's, it's already happening and, uh, and it's also influencing the, the you know, legacy uh, dealers and uh, manufacturers. But does the EV Association encourage this? Does the EV Association give recommendations? Does the EV Association have links on its website to allow me to go to um, a, an online dealer and buy an electric car that fast with an imprimatur that the EV association likes this. That's a, actually, Jay, that's a great idea. It hasn't been implemented yet. Uh, one of the challenges that we have is to ensure that, you know, there's, there's um, you know, fairness and equity. So if we were to get down the, go down the path of um, creating a page that will make recommendations, we wanna make sure that we can keep that updated. Uh, it is, um, 
what we have on, on, the, on the contrary, one of the things that we've started to do, which is more generic, is we've started to uh, point people to used vehicles, to pre-owned vehicles, which represents an immense value for many consumers here. Um, there are a lot of cars that are coming off leases that are coming up that are being traded in. And these cars still have quite a bit of life in them, uh, warranties, et cetera. So we, we advertise that, but we haven't gone to the point of uh, making very specific recommendations. We, we point people to, to other websites that already do that. Okay, well, I hope, I hope, I hope it's in the future somewhere. Uh, Tim, as a lawyer, uh, you'll appreciate my, my suggestion. My suggestion, which I have suggested to a number of people, but it really hasn't happened, um, is that we could incentivize entrepreneurs to build charging station facilities. However we do it, wherever they choose to do it, whatever the market you know, is best. Um, why don't we do that? You know, right now, recently, the PUC approved a, a Hawaiian Electric um, initiative to install a, a substantial number of charging stations, some quick, some not so quick, but hundreds altogether around mostly Oahu, I think. Um, and, th and that will be funded through ratepayer contributions. Um, and that will be, um, that will not involve uh, independent uh, external entrepreneurs. But if I made a governmental uh, incentive of some kind, maybe a tax holiday, who knows what, um, to entrepreneurs who say that they will um, build uh, infrastructure for electric vehicles, I know that that would proliferate the number way, way beyond what you might imagine even the utility could do. Uh, what do you think of that idea? And what, what would you add in terms of making it feasible? Yeah, well, a couple of responses. Uh, first, um, incentives are appropriate in this case because the market is still fairly nascent and the charging um, EV charging model for making money is still a bit tricky because it's kind of chicken and egg. You don't have enough people with EVs because you often don't have enough charging. Therefore, you don't have enough charging to make money with EV charging. So this is a you know a, a really good example of what we call a market failure. This is where you know policy really can come in and help by, like you said, providing some incentives. That said, uh, the HECO model is primarily for what they call make readies, which is building out the infrastructure to install the charger. So they then own that infrastructure. They make money off the infrastructure. It's still open in many cases to third parties coming in and actually installing the charger, to make money off the charger. For example, on the big down, a lot of um, uh, fast chargers are owned by green lots and they make the money off the charging, even though the utility gets to build out the infrastructure and make money off the infrastructure. So it's currently kind of a mixed model. We certainly though do see a need for a lot more chargers uh, on the big island and elsewhere. Oahu of course has far more population than we do. We're about, I think one seventh, the, you know, one-fifth the population of Oahu. Yeah, Oahu has shorter distances, though. It Big does, Island it does. has a, a greater, you know, risk of range anxiety. Exactly, yeah. And one thing we're kind of um, batting around internally is how many charges you, charges you should have at each location. Um, I'm an advocate of three to four uh, fast charges at each location to basically future-proof those charging stations for the next decade. And that gives people range confidence when you see that many chargers and you know you can go anywhere on the island and charge uh, without too much hassle or waiting too long and also hopefully not pay too much. Um, so in short answer, you know, yeah, we want to see a lot more incentives currently than we have uh, to get more charging stations installed all through Hawaii. And well, that would have to be a, another legislative point. That's not going to happen without some legislative imprimatur. Um, Great. Okay, no, I, I wanted to ask you as a, as a tech guy, um, you mentioned uh, en passant the, um, the possibility that there is software out there uh, that would allow me to identify um, a charging station nearby. You know, I, I'm developing a little anxiety uh, and uh, I, I only have X miles left on my, on my, my dashboard. Uh, I need to get a charge. So I look at my cell phone and it tells me where the nearest charging station is. I can do that with a restaurant uh, why can't I do it with a charging station? Um, so the question is, is there anything out there right now that is operating and public and, uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, useful uh, in terms of software, especially mobile software? Uh, and uh, whether or not there is, what is the need to have further software designed and deployed in Hawaii 
to cover not only the existing charging stations, um, but to increase, you know, to, to add to the database, so to speak, so that every time a charging station comes online, it's on this mobile app. Where mm -hmm. are we in terms of the development of this software? It's a gr great question, Jay. Um, so at the moment, there are multiple apps. So first of all, there are multiple providers, ChargePoint, GreenLots, uh, there are a number of these uh, providers that manage the charging stations, and each of them have apps that you can actually uh, up, uh, you know, download and utilize to interact with these stations. Uh, there's, a there's another application, which is called PlugShare, and PlugShare consolidates all of this information. Uh, the inputs at the moment are uh, manual, so people will identify uh, you know, a, ch a station that's not on there, or they, they opt to have their personal charging station available to the public. So they can actually submit information on. So there's, it's crowdsourced to, to some extent. But the, the, the point is that if you're traveling and you're wanting to figure out, okay, I'm gonna be in Waimea, uh, what are the charging stations in, in around there? You, you are able to get on the app and you know, through geolocation and all that good stuff, you're able to find it, right? You're able to find it. Now, uh, the other thing is cars are also becoming smarter. These will, are it, will it tell me if there's fast charging station versus slow charging station? Yes. Because I do not want to spend more than, say, 20 minutes charging. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it is. The, the, they color code the different types of chargers. So it's, you know, level two, level, you know, DC fast charger, and then also the residential ones that are available. Uh, so, yes. Now, uh, I will say that there are still some failings associated with this because um, you know, one of the challenges, for example, is um, being able to identify whether or not something is actually being, being utilized at that point in time. So to be able to do that, you need to go on to the manufacturer's or the provider's application and then see, okay, um, is there someone using this right now? Is it out of order? Uh, you know, that sort of thing. So um, it's not as usable as it could be, but, you know, the need is there and I'm, you know, and at some point it's going to be addressed. The other no, thing it's is like, the, it's like the bike, the, the Biki, Biki uh, bike, yeah. biking program, you know, it, yeah. it's going to, the bike program sends back a wireless signal to, through the internet and tells you how many bikes are there. It tells you which bikes are broken, maybe. Um, and so all of this is doable. Uh, and I would expect pretty easily uh, for charging stations, all the, all the functionality you just talked about. Yes, yes. The, the functionality is there, and at some point, and it's already starting to happen, uh, it'll be incorporated into the actual vehicles. So uh, on your interface in the car, you'll be able to say, okay, well, I'm running low, I need to charge, where's the nearest one, and uh, be able to make a selection. And obviously, in places like the mainland, it's you know even more pronounced and more advanced, and our hope is that we'll see something similar here on, mm -hmm. across the state. Is it on your website, the EV Association website? Information on PlugShare, those apps, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, good. we do. Good, good. So, um, you know, one interesting thing is you guys have been focused, and I have too, on the Big Island, because the Big Island is, um, well, it's my favorite island, you know, and I guess that, that goes- the Big problem. Island, best island. <laughs> but, um, you know, what you're doing does have statewide uh, impact and interest. And I wonder, uh, you know, Tam, what you see going forward um, for these various initiatives, ideas, incentives, what have you, in terms of taking the idea, taking the, mm, mm, taking the lessons you learn on the Big Island and uh, deploying them in every island. Uh, what, what are your thoughts and plans about that? You know, to be clear, the Hawaii EV Association is a statewide organization. We actually have chapters for each island. For example, there's a Big Island EV Association, the Kauai Island EV Association, there's a new Maui chapter. And on Oahu, it is the Tesla Club, which doubles as basically a, a county level EV association for Oahu. So when I talk about policy recommendations, et cetera, that's for state policy. Now we do have a sister organization that we work with pretty closely. Uh, both Noel and, I, Noel and I are on the board of that organization too, called Think Big, Big Island Green, which you mentioned in the intro. And so Big Island, Think Big is focused on the Big Island, obviously. And we do certainly try to uh, pilot uh, initiatives here on the Big Island that we hope will have some statewide impact also. There's a lot of cross-pollination going on, but Hawaii EV is focused on state policy. Mm. We're out of time, you know, Tam, and I, uh, and I don't know, I don't have a clear feeling as to whether I allowed you guys enough room to say what you wanted to say to our viewership 
uh, about the subject. Uh, that is the, the use case, or maybe the application case for electric vehicles. Uh, can you talk about what, what else you want to leave with them? Uh, go ahead, Noel. Yeah, so I, you know, just to, this is a reiteration, right? We, we have to shift. Um, we, we need to focus on energy efficiency, right, across our systems, our buildings, our transportation, et cetera. Um, accelerating our adoption to electric vehicles is a significant way to do that. It all, also allows us to reduce emissions, clean the air, all that good stuff. Um, there is value in hydrogen. It has to be green, right? It can't be dealing with fossil fuels. It has to be produced through renewables. And, uh, and lastly, uh, we need to focus research and investment on all, the more challenging applications for hydrogen. The passenger car is an easy problem. You know, the, that, that's, that's not what we should be solving with hydrogen. We should be solving for liquid aviation fuels that are sustainable. We need to be solving for heavy freight, ocean. I mean, we've got all this, you know, uh, uh, inter-island, um, you know, transport that's happening. Let's figure out how to make that happen. Uh, Trans-Pacific, trans-oceanic, and also air. There's a lot of research that needs to happen there. And, and the last is, is grid storage. You know, we can't just rely on, bat on batteries for grid storage. I mean, there's, there's hope and value in hydrogen. So my, my sense is that there's value here. Let's just focus the attention on where it needs to be focused and let the battery electrics just do what they need to do and get it done as quickly as possible. Agreed. So Tam, uh, on a percentage basis, how much of, of what Noel said do you agree with? 100%. <laughs> Okay, that's that's rare, but like I said, no, no, he could have said one hundred and ten percent. You know, he could have done. That. <laughs> <laughs> what else would you leave with our viewers, Tim? You know, I think Noel said it really well. Um, you know, even though we are the Hawaii EV Association, we fully recognize the benefits of non-car solutions as the primary solutions, including walking, biking, carpooling, ride sharing, uh, the whole gamut. Uh, we have chosen though the niche of electric vehicle policy because that's really where we feel like in Hawaii there hasn't been enough focus. Great, you guys. I, I, I wish you well. I uh, can tell you that Think Tech is with you at least 100%. <laughs> we we want to see you succeed. We want to see you have an effect on the state. We want the state to be a leader in all of those things. Uh, thank you, Tam Hunt. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Aloha, you guys. Aloha. Thank you.